Welcome exceptional engineers, this is Prof G, and I hope that you pin this video as a favorite because we're going to learn how to identify pins on a CircuitPython board. Now I'll work mostly with a Raspberry Pi Pico board in this lesson. This is the board my students are shifting to after they began learning CircuitPython on a Circuit Playground Bluefruit. Now we'll also use the Pico to learn how to identify pins and the pin names that we should use in our CircuitPython code. We'll learn about different power options for the Pico boards. We'll learn how to use a breadboard and we'll write some code to give us even more detail about our board. And we'll eventually wire up a NeoPixel strip to our board and use CircuitPython to get it flashing. Hopefully you'll find that we do all of this in a way that increases your engineering and programming skills because I'll briefly compare the results of what we do on a Pico W board with several other boards that can run CircuitPython. We'll see how things differ and how they're the same on different boards, and I'll demonstrate how we can get a project created for one board up and running on another board. We'll also introduce some important and common terms that you'll hear when working with electronics, including I squared C, SPY, and UART. We'll talk about board safety and care, and I'll demonstrate a bunch of tips, tricks, and other useful information that hopefully you'll find helpful in your engineering and coding journey. So let's pin down these concepts and light things up with more big learning. Now, if you look at the various boards, you can see that the pinholes usually have names silkscreened directly near them. Now, sometimes they're easy to read. Sometimes they're super tiny and not in very convenient places. Unfortunately, the names on the Pico board are underneath the board, which makes it tough when you're using a breadboard. And tiny is not good for someone like me. I have bad eyesight, so bad that I can't drive a car, but every vendor has a pinout diagram that you can search for and find online. When I work with this board, I usually leave the diagram up in my browser so that I can quickly reference where the pins are. But another challenge is that even when you see names, there are often multiple names or aliases for each pin. And you'll definitely want to know which names and objects apply to your pins. So we're going to use a handy CircuitPython program that you can run on any board with CircuitPython installed, and it'll output a row for each pin along with all of the names and aliases that can be used for that pin. Now, rather than typing it in, I'm going to grab the code from an Adafruit page. I'm going to search online for Adafruit CircuitPython pin map script, and I'm going to head to this page, scroll and find the short script labeled CircuitPython Essentials pin map script, click copy code, head to Moo, paste in our code, make sure your board is configured and plugged in. I'm using my Raspberry Pi Pico W board. My students should use that board too. Save it as code.py on your CircuitPy volume, then open the serial monitor, and we see the output. Your output will look different if you're using a different board. And to give you an idea of how output will vary, here is the output from this script compared across four different boards, including the Feather RP2040, the Cutie Pie ESP32-S3, and the Circuit Playground Bluefruit. And you'll see more entries for boards that have more pins and built-in capabilities. Not surprisingly, the tiny Cutie Pie has the smallest output. Now we see certain lines have multiple pin names on them. For example, on the Pico W, we see that board.a0 is followed by board.gp26 and even board.gp underscore a0. Now you can use any of these names to refer to pin gp26. In fact, a0 through a2 are also referred to as gp26 through gp28. And if we search online for the pinout diagram for the Raspberry Pi Pico W, we see that we're referring to these pins here. Now this is actually pretty important to point out. These pins are analog pins. Now in an earlier CircuitPython school lesson, my students learned that analog devices send a range of inputs rather than just the one or zero of digital devices. An example of this is a potentiometer knob, which we turned and produced output ranging from 0 to 65,535. Now most of the digital devices that we hook up, whether they're lights, buttons, motors, they can use the GP pin. But if you've got an analog device like a potentiometer, then you want to make sure that you use one of these GP pins that are also labeled A0, A1, or A2. So those pins that also have the A names are specifically set aside to work with analog devices. They can also be used with digital too, but it's best to save them for any analog work. In fact, here's a potentiometer that I've wired up like this. If you're intimidated by the breadboard, don't be. We'll learn more about this later in the lesson. I've wired the data input to GP26. And if you check the result of the pinout script run on the Pico, we see that the GP26 pin has an alias of A0, which is an analog pin. Remember, the analog pins are A0 through A2. And as we learned in an earlier lesson with the Circuit Playground Bluefruit, I need to limit a potentiometer to 3.3 volts. So I've also wired power to the 3.3 volt out pin, and any ground pin works for the ground wire. I've written some quick code to print out the results of the potentiometer reading. I've referred to it in my code as board.a0, an alias for pin GP26. If I run the code, it outputs fine. Now if I change board.a0 to an alias for that pin, which is board.gp26, then save the code, I can see that the output also works fine. 
Now, while I'm here, why don't I also point out that bit about analog only pins. So if I try to hook up my potentiometer to a non-analog pin, one of the digital pins like GP15 here, then I change the code to set up the potentiometer on pin board.gp15. When I save my code, I get this error here. Line four says invalid pin because I'm not using a pin that's an A pin, an analog pin, GP15 is not an analog pin. So if you're using a potentiometer, pay attention to which pins work with analog devices and only use those. In our lessons, I'll always point out when a device needs an analog pin. Now if we take a look at this slide, we also see that there's some other aliases for different functions on different boards. The Feather RP2040 board has board.d3 aliased as board.led, so that blinks the LED light. We did that in the prior lesson. And the CPB can get it its LED light with board.d13, board.led, or even just board.l. Now since we started talking about the pinout diagram for the Pico W, let's look at that again and a bit of a pro tip. There's a great interactive pinout diagram that you can find for the Pico online at pico.pinout.xyz. Now it only shows the Pico, not the Pico W, but the pins are just about identical. No problem using this if you're using a Pico W. In fact, I always have this page up when I'm working with a Pico board. You can click here to get a rear view of the board, or you can show or hide different elements if you'd like. And as mentioned, there are eight ground pins on the Pico board. You can use any of these for ground, and you can even share ground pins across multiple devices if you need to. Now we mentioned 3.3 volt out is for 3.3 volt power. V bus gets power from the USB port, so that can give you more power than 3.3 volts. That's fine for NeoPixel lights or for motors. If you're powering your device in a mobile project using something like a cell phone battery that's plugged into your USB port, VBus will get its power from the battery too. And like the ground pin, it's okay for components to share a board's power pins too, but know that it is possible to use more power than is supplied by a board. Hook up too many NeoPixel lights or too many motors to a board, for example, and your lights might dim or your motors might not even run. We won't be exceeding any limits in our tutorial videos, though. We'll cover more of the pins in this board in greater detail as we need to in future lessons. Now we've also got lots of digital pins on this board to use for digital input and output. These are the pins that begin with GP, and even our analog pins can be used for digital as well. GP stands for General Purpose Input and Output. Pin names vary by board. Some boards will refer to them as D pins for digital pins. The help board command in the REPL or the pinout map script that we just ran will show you the proper pin names to use in your code. And if you're following along with our previous CircuitPython School videos, there were lots of lessons where we use digital I.O. libraries, including worker with buttons. Those are digital inputs. And examples of digital outputs also include when we work with sound, sending audio to the speaker, working with servos where we sent out a signal to control a motor, even the blink script we used in the previous lesson. Now another thing we're going to be working with is wiring up devices that communicate with our board using a communication mechanism called I squared C. Now in an earlier video we mentioned that I squared C is the communication scheme used in what Adafruit calls the Stemma QT port. SparkFun calls this the quick connection. This is a really handy connection to use because it takes the four wires used in I squared C and it allows you to plug them into a single port like we see here with this cable that connects a temperature sensor into the cutie pie. Now I squared C has four wires power, which is usually red, ground, which is usually black, SDA, which is data, and that's usually blue, and SCL, or clock, which is usually yellow. Now, if your board has a Stemma QT connector, you can see how handy this is, but the Raspberry Pi Pico boards don't have a Stemma QT port. But we can wire one up using a cable like this that has four wires with pins on them on one end and Stemma QT connections on the other. So to do that, power or red will go to 3.3 volt, ground or black will go to any ground pin. Now the other two wires used in I squared C are SDA, which is data. Almost always you'll see this as a blue wire. And SCL, which is clock or timing, that's usually a yellow wire. Now if we look at the diagram for the Pico, we see lots of pins that are labeled SDA or SCL. In fact, most GP pins can be used as either one or the other. Now other boards might have specific pins that are limited to SDA or SCL. For example, on the Circuit Playground Blue Fruit, SDA is silk screened right alongside pin 5, so you only use pin 5 for SDA, while SCL is on pin A4. Now even though the Pico and Pico W has lots of flexibility for using the pins, when hooking up I squared C, I'm going to advise my students to connect blue, which is SDA, to G4, and yellow, which is SCL, to G5. Now the reason for that is that there's actually a function in CircuitPython that we can use on our board to create I squared C objects. It's not available on every board, but it is available on most boards that have a Stemma QT port, and it is available on the Pico boards even though they don't have Stemma QT ports. So if we wanted to create an I squared C object that we would call I2C, we just write code like this, I2C equals board dot, and in all caps, Stemma underscore I2C with an open and closed paren. We'll use this more in future lessons.
Now another reason to use GP4 and GP5 for SDA and SCL on a Pico board is that there's also a handy device that you can buy for less than two bucks called the Pico Cowbell. It's sort of a play on words because some people were calling the Pico W the P cow. Now this little device includes a built-in Stemma QT port on it. Now if you buy this, you need to solder headers on the board, but it's nice you can plug your board directly into the cowbell and the built-in Stemma QT port is directly mapped to GP4 and GP5. So again, pro tip for my students when attaching an external Stemma QT connector to a Raspberry Pi Pico board, always use GP4 for blue and GP5 for yellow. Now, not to overwhelm you with too much information, but I thought that I'd mention two other terms that you might come across when you're reading learn guides, but we're not going to be using these terms in our next few lessons. Now, while I squared C is the most popular communication mechanism between boards and devices, it's what's used inside of STEM QT. There are other protocols as well. These include SPI or SPI, which stands for Serial Peripheral Interface. You might use SPI for things that need to be sent large amounts of data, like this TFT color display. SPI also involves more wiring. Now some boards and diagrams label pins reserved or recommended for SPI use. These would include MOSI or MISO on older boards. Those are outdated terms, but you'll still see them around a lot. They're being replaced by newer terms, COPY and SIPO, which stand for controller out peripheral in and controller in peripheral out respectively. Now you'll see yet additional terms for the Pico boards, SPI underscore TX for MOSI and SPI underscore RX for MISO. There's also another mechanism called UART, which is a type of serial communication. This mechanism uses the RX and TX pins that you see here. You're likely to see these if you're connecting a GPS device, a MIDI device for music. UART is also used in certain biometric devices like fingerprint scanners, as well as peripherals like thermal printers. We're not using any of those in our lessons though. You might see this term show up in Bluetooth code, even though we don't deal with any wiring when we work with Bluetooth. So with our newfound understanding of our board, the pins we can use and some of the key terms We'll encounter in learn guides let's wire up some neopixel lights now the same wiring approach will work with either neopixel light strips or strands because they both have the same three wires remember from our earlier video neopixel lights have three wires for power usually red ground usually black and data here that's the white wire and I'll show you a few ways we can connect this to different boards. Now here I'm using a Raspberry Pi Pico W board and I've soldered header pins on this so I can use it easily with a breadboard. So I'm gonna plug this board into the breadboard. That's this little plastic rectangle here. And the breadboard is gonna help me easily set up connections between the pins on my board and the wires in my devices. Now I'm gonna plug the microcontroller in like this. The header pins soldered to the board fit into the holes. Put your USB port to the side of the board so that your USB cable doesn't go over the breadboard. And notice when I plug my board in, these legs, the pins on the board, are straddling this gap here, the center line, which is sometimes called the ravine. And a quick bit about breadboards, with the orientation that you're seeing on screen, these vertical columns are all connected. All pins top to bottom act as if there's a wire flowing between them. That's because if we were to take the plastic off the top of the board, we would see that there's a piece of metal that connects all of these pins. Now there's not a connection across the ravine, so these column connections stop here. And now that we know how a breadboard works, I'm gonna wire up the NeoPixel strip to my microcontroller like this. Since this NeoPixel strip has alligator clips on it, I'm just going to clip each of these alligator clips to a jumper wire with pins on both ends. Then I'm gonna push the other end of the jumper wire pin into the right breadboard hole. So in this orientation, V bus for power is the pin in the lower right, and GP15 is that pin in the upper left. You can use any of the ground pins for your ground. Now, if you're eagle-eyed, you might notice that I have a breadboard that's specifically labeled to work with the Raspberry Pi Pico boards. The pin names and numbers are labeled right on the breadboard. Most breadboards don't have that, but if you do a lot of work with a Pico, it's definitely nice to have. Before we plug our board into our USB cable, now's a good time to review some board care and safety tips. So first, the metal parts of wires in your project should never touch. If that happens while a board is powered on, the board could short out. Now, if that happens, it's unlikely to damage your board, although that is possible. So you definitely wanna make sure the metal parts of the wires are not touching. But if your wires do touch and you get a short, your code will definitely stop running and your board will probably disconnect from Moo and your computer. Now, if your board does short out and that happens to all of us, you can just unplug and replug your board back in. That will usually work. Sometimes you have to press the reset button to reboot CircuitPython. You may have to resave any unsaved work from Moo. 
and in rare cases when working with some boards, a short has caused me to lose files that were saved to the board. So if you suddenly start to get errors suggesting, for example, that you don't have the libraries that you're trying to import, then double check your LIB folder and re-import any files that might have gotten deleted. Every now and then I'll notice that my Pico board isn't showing up when it's connected to my computer, even if I unplug the board and plug it back in. As a pro tip, oftentimes I can fix this by unplugging my Pico and then plugging in another board like the CPB, then unplugging that board and plugging the Pico back in. And if you're still having problems, consult any troubleshooting sections of the Learn Guides, and you can ask for help in Adafruit forums or on Discord. Now in my connection here, my alligator clips have exposed metal, and it's possible that I might accidentally bump the wires and cause a short. You can probably just spread these wires apart so that they don't touch as long as you don't move your project around, but if you're uncoordinated like I am, you can always wrap the ends of the wires in tape if you need to. The covers on the ends of alligator clips can also help keep the metal parts from touching. It also makes sense to be careful when you're handling boards. There could be issues with static electricity, although again the boards are pretty resilient. But remember, you also conduct electricity. So if your fingers touch multiple active pads on the board, especially if they touch power to ground, you might also create a short. So just handle boards carefully, and if things are plugged in and you're moving them around, try to make sure that you're not touching multiple pads at once. Also, don't let pins touch any metal surfaces. For example, I've seen students work with pins or pads touching metal laptop covers. That's a surefire way to short out your board. Now, another very important safety tip, you want to make sure that you're never plugging your ground wire and your power wire into the same pin. And if you plug your ground wire into to a power pin and it's powered, you could see the blue smoke monster. You certainly don't want to damage your board or cause a fire, so be extra careful to make sure that you don't plug ground into a powered power port. Power pins are almost always marked in red on pinout diagrams, and they might have names like VBUS, VIN, VSYS, 5 volt, or 3.3 volt. Also make sure that you don't plug your data wire into any of your power wires by accident. Never get your boards wet. I don't recommend that you carry your electronics around in your pockets too, but always check your pockets before you do the wash. For boards that have header pins on them, it's a good idea to plug them into the breadboard when you carry them around. This way, with the pins inside the breadboard, they're less likely to get bent. And it's definitely a good idea to unplug your board from USB or power when you're doing wiring, double check your breadboard connections, and then plug things back in. Now don't be afraid to work with electronics, but definitely keep these tips in mind and pay close attention when wiring things up. So now that I've got my NeoPixel strip wired up to my breadboard, I can plug my microcontroller into the USB port and I can write a small NeoPixel strip test program. Now you can also save your pin map script if you want to, but now you know where to find that online anytime you need it. And just to test things out, I'm gonna write a simple program to light up all of the lights on the strip one by one, then turn them all off and restart. So I'm gonna replace the code.py file, it's saved to my board, with this program to test the NeoPixel strip by flashing one light at a time. I'm gonna assume everyone watching this has gone through the CircuitPython School video on working with NeoPixel strips, so you'll understand this code, but if not, feel free to go back and review that. I'm gonna import board, time, and NeoPixel. Then I'm gonna set up a couple of variables, strip underscore num underscore of underscore lights, and I'll set that equal to 30, because there are 30 lights in my NeoPixel strip strip underscore pin, I'm gonna set that equal to board.gp15. Why gp15? Because that's the pin we plugged our NeoPixels data wire into. If you used a different pin, make sure you refer to that pin's name here. Then I'll set up my NeoPixel strip, I'll just call that strip, and I'll set it equal to NeoPixel dot capital N Neo capital P pixel, and in parentheses, strip underscore pin comma strip num of lights. Then in my while true loop, make sure you have your colon at the end, I'm gonna put in a for loop for i in range, and that's gonna be strip number of lights colon, and then inside that, I'm just going to say strip, which is my light strip, in brackets i, this refers to an individual light, and I'm going through all the lights in the strip, and I'll set that equal to, in parentheses, 0, 0, 255, these are my RGB colors, and 255 is full on blue. Then I'll pause for one tenth of a second by saying time.sleep and in parentheses 0 0.1. I'll repeat this loop for all 30 lights numbered 0 through 29. Then when I've gone through all of those, my loop is done. I'll outdent. I'll say strip.fill and in double parentheses 0, 0, 0, close double parentheses. That's going to turn off all the lights in my strip. And that's it. After I hit this line, then I start everything over again from the top of the while true loop. So now we can open up our serial monitor. I'll resave this code. We don't have any errors, and look at that. Our lights are flashing, everything's working perfectly, we've just breadboarded with a Pico board and used CircuitPython to light up a NeoPixel strip.
Good work, coder. Now, just to demonstrate how we can work with different boards, here I've got one of those ultra tiny Adafruit Cutie Pie boards. Now, while I could solder headers onto the board like this, I didn't do that with this board. Sometimes you might not want header pins on your board. You usually want header pins when you're working with a breadboard and you're learning, but for final projects, you often solder wires directly onto the pins, and that'll keep the boards flatter so they fit nicer into containers or wearables. Sometimes you want to try out a circuit before soldering the wires directly to the board. Well, one alternative is to use these IC hooks. Now, I've got alligator clips to the NeoPixel attached to a jumper wire, and the other end of the jumper wire is in a socket that's attached to this IC hook. And if I pull down on these little handles, you can see that there's a little hook that opens up. I can clamp this directly into the pinholes on my board. This will create a continuous connection without any soldering and without needing headers or a breadboard. So I'm going to hook ground to ground. And although I had previously hooked my NeoPixel to pin GP15 on the Pico W, there's no pin GP15 on the Cutie Pie board. So I'm going to clip it to pin A1 instead. I'm going to hook power to 3.3 volts since there's no VIN or VIN on the Cutie Pie. So here's a closer look. Signal to A1, power to 3 volt, and ground to ground. And I'll return to Moo and I'll modify my code so that strip underscore pin now refers to board dot A1 instead of GP15. Then save. And we usually have Labcat Admiral Grace in here. This is the other Labcat, Tabitha. And would you look at that? Circuit Python code with only one line modification running on a completely different board. So now you know how to work with different boards, even though they might have different pins and different configurations. So we had lots of big learning in this video. We learned how to use the pin map script to identify pins, objects, and their aliases for a given board. We learned how to read and interpret the output of this script across multiple boards. We got our first look at pinout diagrams. We covered key terms I squared C, SPY, and UART. We gave some important board care and safety tips. We had our first introduction to breadboards. And we learned to hook up boards with differing pin configurations, modify the code, and get a NeoPixel strip flashing on these boards despite these differences. You should now not only be feeling like a programmer, but also like an engineer. Keep at it, skilled one. There's more goodness to come.